Hey everybody, welcome to the live stream tonight on a Thursday evening. I'm pumped and excited on fire to be with you guys tonight, looking through the comments and I see so many familiar people that have joined us tonight. So hello to all of you. Thanks for being here tonight. And it's going to be a fun evening tonight. Feel free to leave your comments, ask some questions. I'm going to first make a little presentation about two of the common fears that we as beekeepers really need to figure out how to conquer because these fears uh, probably are holding us back a little bit. So I'll, we'll be talking about that tonight. So pay attention to that. Maybe we'll help you alleviate some fears and build up your confidence in beekeeping. Hope you're having a great day. I, I hope the weather's shaping up. It, it finally got uh, better weather here in Illinois. Uh, today was the first real day where you could walk outside and go, Wow, what a beautiful day. <laughs> I mean, now I had those days back in February, <laughs> a few of them in March, but uh, none in April, I don't think. And finally today, a uh, beautiful day. So I spent a lot of time today out working bees and making videos for you guys doing a lot of a lot of video filming. It was a it was a, a full day of capturing videos and uh, doing a bunch of stuff in the beehives. A lot of fun stuff, a lot of good footage for future videos. So that's going to be good. I'm going to be publishing a video tomorrow on moving hives. Um, it's going to be a really good video for you guys to watch. If you ever have to move a hive, we'll talk uh, in the video, I'm going to show you how I moved a hive uh, on the same piece of property, big gigantic hives. And uh, that's going to be good for you guys to watch if nothing else, the entertainment value is just right up there. <laughs> I spend some uh, dark evenings filming, getting ready to move them. And I spent an early morning this morning filming it. So I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Uh, I think I did actually, but it's good to be with you guys. And so um, I'm going to start by sharing with you guys what I want to talk to you about first. Um, I've got a beep going on. Hmm. We may have to put up with that. Um, but what I want to share with you guys first has to do with two common fears that beekeepers face. And look at this. These fears can actually hold us back as beekeepers. Now, I was thinking about just saying what they were, but I looked them up and, you know, all fears have this awesome name associated with them. So we've got these two fears. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is a tickophobia. A tickophobia. It's not the fear of ticks. It sounds like it would be <laughs> a tickophobia, right? But it's not. And then we're going to talk about neophobia. Now, these common fears really can hold us back. So let's jump right into it. It's not really the fear of being stung. I know that's probably the first choice that most people thought, oh, the fear of beekeeping holding me back. I don't want to be stung when I work my hives. I'm scared about, you know, getting stung. I got stung a few times today. And when I got stung was when I thought I could get by with just a hat and a veil, no gloves and anything. I got stung mostly through my pants today. <laughs> you know, oh man, even when I had a bee suit on, I'm like, okay, why are my legs hurting? And there's, there's stingers sticking out of my legs. But moving hives can be really, uh, it can really irritate the bees. So I, I asked for it. But it's not bee stings. Beekeepers struggle with two fears that you may not even realize that you struggle with. Um, it's one of them is the, you might think, well, uh, the, the fear of failing. It's the fear of actually killing my bees, uh, not being able to keep my bees alive, or the fear of this whole new hobby. It's brand new. It seems so confusing to me. I get that a lot. I really do. New, new beginners are like overwhelmed. I have so many questions and probably get a lot tonight of people asking, I don't know what to do. I'm so confused. I don't see a queen. Uh, I don't see a queen or I see a queen cup. I see a queen cell. I don't know if I have a queen in there. I don't see any brood. I see some brood. A lot of questions and a lot of people don't know what to do about that. So these are two areas that most beekeepers um, just want to give up. You know, they, they get, they all, I hear beekeepers often say things like, well, if I can't make any honey again this year, I'm done. I'm not going to work on bees anymore. Or a lot of people say this, you know what? I lost bees in the winter again. And if I can't, if my bees die again this winter, I'm throwing in the towel. And these 
These two fears are just that. These are the two fears that actually um, have these unique names, antichophobia, neophobia. So let's jump right into it. Um, and I think it's really important to realize a tickophobia. What is that? It's the fear of actually failing, a tickophobia. You know, and that's because when we have a tickophobia, we have an ego and we don't want to fail because we feel like if we fail, gosh, it's going to make me look bad. So we wrestle with that. How do I overcome the fear of failure? Because, you know, I don't want to stink at beekeeping. I don't want to be known as the person who killed my bees with something I did wrong. And I, I hear that a lot in people that I mentor, people that I help. Um, I do hear that a lot. So we have to be careful about sometimes um, trying to figure out how do I overcome some of my fears? I, I really need to overcome these fears. So we have to work on building up our confidence and courage that we don't, that we don't want to fear. Um, so, um, Let's see, Sherry's having a little problem with the uh, monitor downstairs. So, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, I can't, can't really go down and help you right now. <laughs> so, okay. So Sherry says she's having trouble with uh, her end of the deal. So we'll have to work on that, I guess. So let's get back into it today. And uh, thank you. We have Big Dog Apiary Farm. Thank you for your donation of $40. I really appreciate it. Appreciate that so much. It means a lot to us for any of you that make donations on Super Chat. So really do appreciate that. Um, so what do we do to overcome these fears? We have to work on building up our confidence, building up our courage, like working without gloves, for example. Let me give you an idea. Some of you might say, you know, I really fear what I'm going to do. Um, how do I learn to work with uh, bare hands, for example? Uh, I'm too scared to try that. That's a big fear. I don't want to, I want to kind of, you know, work bees, but now I'm going to have to um, learn to work them barehanded. What do I do? Well, one of the ways that you can do it is wear your gloves for a while, but then when you want to work barehanded, just take one glove off, you know, just take a moment, take a glove off for, for one minute and just move slowly, see if you can, can get used to it. And then you can say, okay, I, I see how this is going to go. It's going to be okay. I can do this. So if you don't just take off both gloves, pile in there, that's, that's too much. So learn to work into it gently um, and overcome some fears that way. It's, and, and you also need to realize that you're not the only one who has ha ever had a, a fear in beekeeping. Some of the things that we have to do to work up our confidence and our courage takes a long time. And you're not the only one that struggles with these fears. Believe me, all of us have had the same fears. A lot of times people think I'm the only one that's working with these fears. I don't know what to do about it. So you're, you're not the only one. So just be patient and just um, understand you have to learn, you have to adapt, and you have to try new things. So you're not the only one. Um, Learning is going to help you a lot overcome some of your fears for sure. And achieving more knowledge on the subject is always the best way to overcome your fears. We're always scared of things that we don't know much about. So that's really important to really put time in <clears throat> and overcoming your fears by gaining more knowledge on the, on the subject. Uh, we appreciate that $20 donation. That's my biggest problem, fear of killing my bees. I know we all feel that way. Um, it's always um, overwhelming to think, boy, there's so much going on in the beehive and I need to watch for mites. I need to give them room to grow. So I appreciate that $20 donation so much. Really do. Um, yeah, it's a big, it's a big fear of a lot of people. They feel very responsible. We are, we don't want our bees to die. So I understand the atikophobia, the fear of, you know, it's just learning to adapt and keep trying new things that work. Um, none of us want to fail. None of us feel good about failure. I mean, we're really wanting to succeed. I think that's really important that we learn to succeed. And a lot, it's a lot easier to fail, <laughs> isn't it really? A lot easier to fail than it is to succeed. To succeed takes a lot of hard work. You know, if you want to be a successful beekeeper, it's going to take a lot of hard work. 
if you want bees to fail, it doesn't really require you to do anything. <laughs> They'll fail on their own, right? So keeping bees alive, keeping them healthy requires hard work. It takes time. It takes a lot of time and it takes money. You have to buy green drone comb or another super, give them more room to grow, a mite test kit. You have to buy a smoker. You know, you got to spend money and you got to put the effort in. And, and so, but even get this, even after you work hard, you put time into it, you, you spend money, they can still fail. It doesn't mean you're a bad beekeeper. You know, your bees can still get Nosema serrani, even though you've done everything perfectly and they can die of that microsporidium. So it happens, you know, you can do everything perfectly. Your bees can succumb and get overpowered by the bacteria brood disease of American fowl brood, European fowl brood. So um, we have to hang in there. Beekeepers that hang in there and keep going really do have this ability to have a mental strength and a fortitude to keep going even after setbacks and failures. You're just like, I'm going to stay in there even after I have all these failures and all these setbacks. I'm going to hang in there and keep trying. So sometimes we really do struggle with that. Now, that brings us to the second fear a lot of beekeepers have is neophobia. You know what neophobia is? It's a fear of trying something new. Now, when you first think about beekeeping, you might have this neophobia, like I'm too scared to try beekeeping. Oh no, I don't know if I can do this or not. We all have that fear. Those kind of fears are healthy for us because we need that to protect us from doing something that can harm us. So that's good to have that kind of fear, right? Trying something new, trying something different. It's fun. It energizes us, but it brings a little fear. But sometimes, again, we fear as beekeepers, we're going to fail at something. So sometimes we don't even want to attempt it. Or we may be doing something um, that someone else is telling us to do because we're too scared to try something on our own. We're like, I want to try something new, but my buddy down the road that got me started in beekeeping says never to do that, so I'm never going to do it. Sometimes we're governed by a personality on YouTube <laughs> or someone, someone that we really admire, and they're telling us how to do things, and they advise us against something, but we really want to try it. And so sometimes we are just faced with a fear of trying something new because someone's telling us not to, even though we'd like to, or trying something different. You know, sometimes we're like, this year I'm going to go without treating and see what happens. But everybody says, well, you're, that's not going to work out well for you. Your bees are going to die from mites if you don't treat them, so on. But you maybe you feel that kind of pressure and you don't want to look like an idiot. So you keep kind of going along with the, the herd mentality instead of trying something new. Look, everything that we have, it was once new. You know what I mean? So everything that we do with bees, it was once new. Langstroth invented the Langstroth Hive. Before he did, it wasn't. It was bees were kept in skeps. He invented the Langstroth Hive or created it or kind of in, uh, got it shaped the way he wanted to with removable frame and bee space. And now we have a new hive, which isn't new anymore, but it was new at one time. The smoker was new at one time. And so when things are new, people don't like them at first because, you know, hey, new might mean a failure. It's not going to be a good thing to do. So um, trying something new, sometimes we repeat our own mistakes instead of trying something new. That's really something I find that's uh, humorous. People will continue. I appreciate the donations, by the way. I'm, I'm missing them. But Charlie, thank you. I appreciate that. So a lot of times people um, make the same mistake over and over again because they're doing this. They're making the same mistake. I lost my bees again this winter. What did you do differently? Nothing. Well, you need to try something differently if your bees died in winter and you keep doing the same thing. Try something different. Uh, so don't make the your same mistakes over and over, doing what other people tell you. And a big one is we're ashamed or we're embarrassed when we mess up. And that keeps us from trying something new. For example, queen rearing. I've been talking a lot about queen rearing. My last video that I made yesterday or the day before was about handling queens, putting the attendants in little cages. That was a fun, fun video to make. If you haven't seen that, check that out after this live stream. But queen rearing, raising your own queens, is one of those areas where many, many beekeepers are afraid to try. And yet it can transform your beekeeping 
skill, your beekeeping yard, your beekeeping success, your operation. If you have the ability to have a queen available just like that, at a moment's notice, you can drop a new queen in a hive where a queen's failing. You don't have to think about where do I buy it? What is the genetics or what is the race, if we want to say that, the type of bee, uh, queen that we're going to buy? How soon can you get it to me? Do I have to kill my old? Um, you know, if you raise your own queens, you have so much more muscle and power to operate your bees the way you want to. And if you raise your queens the way you want to, you can control to some degree the genetics you raise queens out of hives that you love, hives that are doing good against diseases, pests, making a lot of honey for you. They're easy to handle. They're maybe showing some mite resistance. So that's a good reason to raise your own queens. But a lot of times people are afraid. They have neophobia. Like, I, I don't want to try to raise queens. I could fail at it. Who cares if you fail? Right now, you're not raising any queens. If, you, if you've never done it, you're not doing it now. <laughs> so uh, you might as well try to do it, right? And see how it goes. That's important. So queen ring is another one. People just have a fear of trying something new. Trying something new and within beekeeping. Once you start beekeeping, try to go without gloves if you want to, if that's important to you. I don't like to go without gloves anymore because I don't like getting stung in the hands. Um, try to raise queens. Try to have a little nucleus going beside your right beside the hive that you love, your main hive or something, get a little nucleus going. Practice, play with a little five frame nucleus. Try some, uh, try making comb honey. Try something new, you see what I'm saying? Um, try a different approach to controlling mites if you're not having success. Try something new with when within beekeeping. It's okay. Sometimes when you're trying something new, uh, people fail to try because they're afraid that they're they're just going to fail at it and they're going to be ashamed. Well, how to overcome this fear of starting something new? Do it in baby steps. Don't have to raise 50 queens to prove you're successful at it. Try to wait, raise one queen. You know, do your graft, graft a few, five, put them in a starter hive. After a day, put them in a finishing hive, which is just a deep with, or two deeps with a queen excluder in the middle. See if you can raise one queen, just one baby step. If you don't, if you don't succeed, try, try again. And so give yourself, always give yourself time for this newness to sink in and for you to learn that it's okay if it takes a while. Something new doesn't mean you have to be successful with it. What happens with you guys sometimes in me, we see somebody on YouTube show us how easy it is to do it. And we try to do it and it's not that easy and we failed at it. And we think, why is it so hard for me? Because they've been doing it for years. They've done it so long that they can make a video about it. <laughs> they failed. They were suffering through getting used to it just like you're going to have to do too. Okay. So it's okay just to spend time, let the newness sink in. Stop expecting instant results and perfection. A lot of you might be dealing with that tonight. You might be thinking, you know what? I'm dealing with always trying to be perfect. Trucker for life gaming. Yeah, $5. Uh, not highly allergic, but advice for someone allergic who wants to get into beekeeping, really wants to get into beekeeping. All right, let me wrap this up and I'll, I'll answer that question. So yeah, perfection. Stop trying to be the perfect beekeeper with zero mites, with thousands of gallons of honey from one hive, with bees that don't sting. I mean, you're living in a fairy tale land if you think that you can be, your bees are going to perform perfectly. No. And just because they don't, it doesn't make you a bad beekeeper. So, um, kind of like wrapping it up, just remember these two common fears can really hurt us if we're scared about failing. And if we're scared about starting something new, that can cause us to be set back. All right, let me start with this question tonight. Let's see, it's about 20 after seven. So uh, if you're not highly allergic to bees, I'm gonna move my screen over here so I can look at you guys. I thought it was, give me a second. Um, but if you're not highly allergic to bees, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you're like me and if you get stung, it really doesn't bother you that much, except maybe you might have some localized swelling. That's the kind of the difference between, what's well, the main difference between a local reaction and anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock means our systems start shutting down. We can't breathe. You know, our heart, 
heart rate changes, uh, blood pressure changes, we, we, it can get systemic. That can be deadly and dangerous. If you're not too highly allergic, what happens means you just have a local reaction. So if you have a local reaction and you want to get into beekeeping, um, what do you do? Well, I guess that means that you're like the rest of us. You know, I got stung on the yarn today, a few times on the leg, uh, a little, little sensitive spot there if I touch it, but it's not swollen or anything. Here's what you do. Wear a lot of protective gear. There's no reason to be stung. You don't have to prove you're a hero and be a show off out there. Look what I can do in my shorts, sandals, and a tank top and no hat and veil. You know, I don't recommend that at all. Bees at any moment can kind of get too defensive for you dressed like that. So wear a lot of protective clothing. Newbie after free bees. How long should I leave out my swarm traps? Leave them out till somebody shows up. If you're looking for free bees, that's the only way you're going to get them is they're going to fly on your property, land in your swarm traps. Um, you can spend a whole year and never catch one. I've done that before too. Now I haven't put out a lot of swarm traps. I put out some just around my place to catch mine if I'm not staying on top of swarm control. <laughs> but by all means, don't feel like, um, you know, don't let that be the thing that keeps you from being a beekeeper. If you don't have any bees right now, uh, don't wait for some to show up uh, because that may take several years. And if you're ready to start um, and you can't afford it, Talk to some beekeepers in your area. You're going to find somebody that has a heart of compassion that might help you start with some bees, uh, break off three or four or five frames out of their hive. David, I'm a new beekeeper. Do I wait to all boxes full of bees and comb, then put super on? Thanks. Good question, Randall. Uh, I'll tell you what I always recommend in my online beekeeping courses is that you wait until each box has five to seven frames drawn out the wax is drawn out by the bees and it's got bees on it at that point that's when you want to add the next box so if you have a deep box with five to seven frames drawn out with bees on it add the next deep box five seven frames and when that gets drawn out good add your super you're going to put that queen excluder between your super and that deep box so i hope that uh, answers your question yeah always think about uh, are my bees going to chimney up the middle if I add too many boxes too quick? Or do I give them time to spread out in the middle? That, that's really the, the key factor in helping those bees expand that way. So good question, Randall. Appreciate that. All right. Well, uh, Trucker Life Gaming, a $5 donation again. Going to start buying everything soon. What is the best time to buy bees in North Alabama? Not really familiar with the time and uh, that much time uh, difference in North Alabama is about your weather and all, but certainly you're going to have to find out, you know, when is spring in Northern Alabama. Uh, if it helps you any here in Illinois, uh, I start, um, we start selling bees in January and we like to have people put them in their hives about the end of April. So you're at least a month ahead of us. Hayden. Hi, I've seen some people who feed the past year's excess crystallized honey back to the bees. What are your thoughts? I would never do that. Never, never, never. But again, never say never. The reason I don't like to do that is because bees aren't really good at handling crystallized um, honey or crystallized sugar because it, it takes a lot of moisture to break that down. What I've seen is that bees actually just take that outside the hive, if you've noticed. Uh, crystallized honey is hard. Bees don't have teeth like we do. They can't chew that. They're going to need a lot of moisture to actually dilute that uh, the crystallized honey diluted enough where they can actually start um, drinking it as a liquid. Matthew, good to see you. Have you ever tried the COT mite test? I bought one to try. I like the idea of not killing bees to test. We all like the idea of not killing bees to test. Yes, I have tested. I've got a video that I made here on YouTube where Dr. John Zavishlak and myself and my friend Steve Rapaski, uh, the swarm, he has a, a book on swarm control. Um, both EA, all of us are EAS master beekeepers. All three of us actually on video uh, ran that test years ago on the CO2 when it first came out. It works. I mean, it uh, anesthetizes the bees and the mites and, you know, they kind of fall off. Um, some people love it because the bees wake back up. When we did it on the video, it took the bees a long time to wake up. And so that test is getting better. 
And so some people really like it. It's going to be a matter of preference for you. I, I don't really know the metrics on how, um, you know, how many mites are going to drop off in comparison to an alcohol wash. It might be very similar on the same number of bees. So, um, yeah, that could be something that you're going to have to try. And if you like it and it works for you and you don't have to kill bees, by all means, that's what you should do. Hey, David, good to see you. Uh, great name there, David. <laughs> Oh, you split a hive today. Should we should we separate splits and how far? Oh my gosh. It is so hard to keep bees from going back to the mother hive, isn't it? So the further you can separate them, preferably three miles away, that helps a lot. It really does. You're going to get foragers going back to that original hive no matter what you do. So that's the tough part. So if you Got to keep them on the same property. You're just going to have to deal with it. And um, I, I dealt with that today uh, by moving hives. Foragers were going back to the old location. It was a pain in the butt. But you're going to have to separate them quite a ways, put something in front of them, try to discourage them from going back to the original hive. Hey, Jason, thanks for the $5. What's the timeline between doing a walkaway split and checking that hive for a new laying queen? No queen cells at the time of split. Thanks. You want to wait 30 days. That's when you're first going to start seeing eggs or some larvae after you make the split. 16 days to raise the queen, five days for her to mature, uh, five days to a week for her to take a mating flight, another week until you start seeing eggs. So it's going to take, you know, 30 days. That's always what I tell people. Tom, all right, good to see you. Biggest fear is disappointing David. You, you better that. You better fear me. I want you to be a good beekeeper. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to worry. You're kidding me. Now, videos, classes, B Team 6 are great. Tom, appreciate that. The more I learn from all of that, the more confident I feel. The fear is gone. Thanks for all you do. Hence the tip. Yeah, you know, that's right. I appreciate the $20 immensely. I'm here to help you guys have confidence, you know. Um, a lot of times I go out there and work bees and I'm on video and I'm, I'm making videos and I, sometimes I appear more confident than I might be <laughs> because the camera's running, <laughs> but no, it's, it's good. You know, you have to, you have to really put on more courage. You have to go out there and remember you're smart. You know what you're doing, do it. And if you get thrown a curveball, just adapt. Hey, Grayson, how you doing there in, uh, see, I think you're in Alabama, aren't you? Wildwoods Honeybee Farms. Love your channel as always. Been putting supers on the bottom lately to see if the bees draw it out faster. What do you think about under supering and the difference of top supering and bottom supering? Thanks, David. That is a good question. So let me talk about that because if you have like here where I live, we have two deep boxes and then we super, we put a super on top of those. Now, where do you put your next super? Do you put it on top of that super or do you put it under the first super? Here's the kind of like the reasoning behind both ways of doing it. If you put your second super under your first super, and this, this super has already got a lot going on, all the bees are going to have to walk through that the new super to get to the super they're used to working. While they're walking through, they might look around and go, hey, let's, let's work this one too, right? Whereas if you put it on the top, it may take longer for them to fill up that first super before they get up to the second super. However, what I prefer to do is use my first super as a queen excluder. Rather than use a plastic or a steel queen excluder, I let my first super be my queen excluder. Does that make sense or do I need to explain it? The reason I let my first super be a queen excluder is because the queen, when she hits that honey super, she can't lay. In nature, that's how a natural hive is constructed. Brood at the bottom, honey above. So when the queen lays and she's moving up and she hits a honey super, she turns around and goes back down 80% of the 90% of the time. She knows the honey barrier. So my queen excluder is my top super. Never had a problem with my other supers getting filled up above that because I'm not using a queen excluder, which is also called a honey excluder because the bees have to wiggle through there and take the nectar up there. And so two thoughts, Grayson, I guess either way really does work great. If your bees are in a heavy nectar flow, they're going to make it happen. That's my opinion. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, good to see you. Is a second deep brood box a must or can you start adding honey supers right away after they've drawn out eight frame 
or so. Um, no, a second deep is something more that you see probably draw a line through, um, I don't know, the middle of Mississippi, that way across uh, the southern part of the U.S. Most people south of there use single deeps, and then most people north of there use double deeps to get through the winter. So we use two deeps here to get through the winter. Now, that's changed a lot. I've gotten through winter recently with a single deep and a honey super. I like that configuration, leaving something to eat, but we have very cold weather. If you're in a climate where your winters uh, don't get below freezing very often or much, then you could probably get by with a single deep and you're going to feed them on top or give them um, a winter be kind or keep a honey super on there. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? Hi, David. Do you use a salic acid treatment? Is this the most effective treatment for you? Absolutely not. I don't use it. And so therefore, it is not the most effective treatment for me. You you guys that follow me are going to get bored of me saying this, but I'll say it again, trying to make it as fast as I can. OA is actually, it's legal dosage, uh, one gram of deep box, um, has been proven to show, and I always refer to Dr. Uh, Cam uh, Cameron Jack. We speak together. Thank you, Mudgy, for your $20 super sticker. Appreciate that. But Dr. Jack has done studies uh, with the University of Florida. Um, Jamie Ellis, he, he works there at the university with Jamie. And they found that the legal dose compared to control highs with vaporization did had no better advantage on my count. So that's why I don't want to spend the money. There's much better things that kill below the caps, such as um, Formic Pro. And so that way, OA, OA only kills orthophoretic adult mites. And so I'm not crazy about OA. I don't want to buy a vaporizer. And I don't like it that it doesn't kill below the caps. Um, and in my climate where I live, it's different for me. I can use Formic Pro a lot of times for the temperature is just right. So I don't have to worry about that as much. So that's important as well. So think about that. It's all about your preference, your temperature, what you want to spend, how much money. Obviously, OA is, uh, if you do it the correct way, there's only one place to buy it. You're not supposed to buy it. It's not legal to buy it at um, other places. If it doesn't say that it's to kill mites on bees, and you're buying it from hardware stores or something like that, it's illegal. You can't do that. That's against the law. Oh, Dallas, thank you for the $20 donation. Been officially a beekeeper for about a month now. Uh, much thanks to you, sir. Don't have a lot of money, so can't uh, do the classes. Your videos have been a huge help. Thank you. Also caught a wild swarm a few days ago. I'm super excited. Those of you that, well, thank you, Dallas. I appreciate the $20 because you're a, you're a hard worker. I know money's tight. The, the economy just stinks. And in most cases, you know, cost of everything is skyrocketing. We, we've had this just, well, we, we want to redo our kitchen after 20 years. It, the, the kitchen has been there forever, but time to redo it and, and the cost of stuff today. But um, a lot of times when people first catch their, or catch their first swarm, it's so surreal. It's like, if you've never seen a swarm, it's just like an otherworldly moment. And so it's so fun. So maybe that's why you got excited about grabbing that swarm. That's good. Again, thanks for your $20. Appreciate that. Oh, a Snoopy noise. So what is your favorite thing to do with beeswax? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Make queen, uh, make queen cups. Uh, I have a video where I show you guys how to make queen cups with a little wooden thing that my uh, father and father-in-law made me. And we love to make queen cups so we can raise queens. So, but I use it for other things uh, around the shops. We have a lot of activities with bees that we need beeswax. When I'm grafting, um, sometimes I need to make my cell bars fit more tightly into my graft uh, frame. So I use a little extra wax to push it in, but we've used beeswax for candles, for a sticky drawer, put a little beeswax on there to make it work a little better. Um, so beeswax is, I love the smell of beeswax too. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you had to learn yourself, discovered on your own? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that's tough. There's so many of them. You know, a lot of things come to mind like 
what kind of gear, what kind of protective gear do I need to wear? Uh, that's, that's important. For a long time, I tried to wear as minimal as I could, you know, maybe just a hat and a veil, no gloves. And uh, that kind of slowed me down because the more hives you get, then the harder it is to go slow because you have so much work to do. And then you speed up, not wearing enough protective gear, bees get a little more defensive. So I, I learned over time, you know, okay, I got to really keep things uh, well protected so I can move through my bees faster, get the job done. Uh, just handling bees, knowing all about bees. The biggest thing for me is learning about bees. The more I know about bees, the better beekeeper I am. And even as a master beekeeper, certified master beekeeper, I'm learning every day. And I, I forget some stuff I learned too, obviously. And I got to relearn stuff. So learning things over and over is really important to me. Learning new things, memory, knowing what you're looking at so you don't have to look it up all the time. It slows you down if you see something and you don't know what to do. So try to learn as much as you can. I'm a trucker on the road two months at a time. It's, is it okay to let them be for two months at a time and then checking them when they get back home? Hey, if that's what you got to do, you got to do it. It's okay. It's never wrong for you to do what you got to do. Two months is fine, okay? I always like to see people test for mites once a month, but if you can only do it once every two months, that's what you got to do. Don't feel bad about it. Don't let other people make you feel bad. Thank you for driving that truck and delivering our supplies. We appreciate it. Make it happen. You make it work on that schedule. Matthew, how are you? What is the reason for feeding candy versus liquid in cold weather? If it doesn't really drop below freezing, do you still need to switch to candy in the winter? I've heard some people say that they don't mind feeding bees um, liquid in the winter. Personally, I feel that it creates a greater desire for the bees to have to defecate more often consuming that liquid. Whereas if it's harder and they have to spend a little bit more time uh, letting it either liquefy or adding liquid to it, then they don't consume it as fast. That's my opinion about it. Thank you, Mark, for that $20 donation. Always great to see Mark there. Um, I get my bees Saturday. Can't wait to apply the lessons I've learned from David and the B Team 6. Keep up the great work. I appreciate that, Mark. Good luck with your bees. I think that's going to be great. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so I like hard candy in the wintertime. Hard candy has been practiced for a long time and beekeeping. I first read about it. They were called candy boards uh, way back in my uh, 37th edition of the ABC XYZ uh, beekeeping book. So they've been out there a long time. Samuel, thank you for your $5 donation. You guys uh, really helped me so much with your donations. I can't tell you uh, what it means to have this little bit of uh, extra income that you're throwing at me, because as you know, it takes so much effort to make these videos. So uh, your money is uh, well handled by me to improve things. I appreciate it so much. David, after harvesting honey, is a common practice to leave frames outside so the bees can clean them? Okay, let's talk about that. Very good question, David. Love your name, by the way. You must have been born close to my time. When I was born in 1960, I think everybody was named David back then because I see people my age named David. People my age are named David, Paul, uh, what are some other names? <laughs> 1960 Bill, you know. Anyway, um, here's the deal. Your question is a good one. It was a good thing to do to leave frames out so that bees can clean them up before we had small height beetle. Now, if you leave them out here now with small height beetle, you run the risk of beetles getting in there and laying eggs and something and attracting beetles to your bee yard. So it's a little risky. Also, if you do it most of us harvest later in the summer, in the fall, when there's a dearth going on. You throw those empty supers out there in the bee yard somewhere too close to your bees. It creates a robbing frenzy. It can be done correctly, but the small high beetle issue is a problem. What I do, David, when I harvest my supers, I put them right back on the hive. Let the bees clean it up. Put it right back on the same hive you took it off of. Let the bees clean it up. It's called a wet super. Let them add more honey to it. But yeah, I've put them out there before, and but you run the risk of some things like small hive beetle or robbing. Hayden, how are you? So if the bees can eat candy boards, why can't they eat crystallized honey? Well, I don't know how other people make their uh, winter feed boards. We don't crystallize the honey. We don't cook it to the crystallized point. 
So our, if you've ever used our Winter Bee Kinds, and you can watch my videos how my bees will consume this within just a few days, um, moisture from the hive actually makes this, I don't want to say liquefy, but I can't think of the best word to use, but it makes it liquefy so the bees can quickly consume the majority of it. Um, so that's the difference. It's a, it's a technique we've created after a couple of years of experimenting with the solution to make the bees, the moisture from the colony, the excess moisture and the bees saliva to actually uh, be able to consume the sugar as almost a liquid state. Caroline, good to see you. Other than your books, what books would you say is a must to read for more immediate or advanced beekeepers? Okay, you're ready. Get a pen and paper ready. You said intermediate or advanced. So here you go. Clarence Collison's book, what, let's see, what's it called? What You Should Know. I think it's called What You Should Know. Something close to that. It's by Clarence, Dr. Clarence Collison. He used to be the academic advisor for the Master Beekeeper Program, the Eastern Napa Cultural Society, where I was certified. Um, and yeah, that's a, that is a very in-depth book, What You Should Know. And he, I think it's on Amazon again. It's a great book. Uh, anything by Tom Seeley is going to be good. Dr. Dewey, I can't, uh, what's his name? Dr. Dewey, Karen, uh, I, you know, Dr. Dewey, Karen is a great person. We work with him at EAS as well. And anything he writes is going to be good. So there's a lot of big hitters out there that have written some great books. Those are some ones that come to mind. Uh, newbie here getting first package Saturday. Oh, getting excited. Thank you for the videos. Your videos took all my fears to total excitement to learn something new and amazing. Thank you. Well, good. Uh, just be calm about it. Um, let, let's enjoy the experience of getting that first package and let's not freak out, be too nervous, videotape it, have somebody videotape you, um, just enjoy the process. Just, you're learning a lot about bees. So just enjoy this moment of learning about bees and what to do and how to handle them. That's good for you. A lot of people getting bees this weekend. Oh, Bob's getting bees. Uh, looks like, uh, getting a nuke in the next week. Is it okay to set the hives up? about four feet apart. Yes and no. Anything else you want to know? <laughs> um, well, obviously, if you put them too close together, when they're new like that, they can take orientation flights. But in this case, they're nucleuses, so they really aren't going to leave because there's already brood in there, so you're at a better chance of them uh, doing fine at four feet apart. The other thing is, some people say when their hives are real close together, then they can... Uh, drift, and that might cause mites to go from one hive to the other. I don't know. Uh, I, I think robbing is where we get a lot of mites that are transferred hive to hive, but drifting can cause mites to, to get from one hive to the other. So you just got to weigh the odds, but I don't mind keeping my bees uh, close together like that. I've had four, uh, four hives on one pallet before, a four, by, a four by four pallet, four hives. So, hey, no, how you doing? Installed six packages in mid-April, fifth, oh, five of six successful. One needs to be requeened because she's missing. Used all of your advice, queen excluder, one-to-one -one sugar on frames, top feeder, I considered it a success. Well, good. Um, I always keep packages that we sell so I can monitor them and see how well they do. I install them on, just like a new beginner would, on undrawn comb. And I follow all the things I tell people to do. Mine have done excellent as well. I think if you don't feed them and you don't do the absconding uh, precautions that I recommend you take, you can lose your bees. They can starve out or the queen can die in her cage. So that's that's good that you followed the good advice there. Great. Hey, Rob, good to see you. Get, be, uh, get bees while learning or learn as much as possible first. Can't wait to meet you at in Amherst. Oh, good. Rob, be sure and let me know that when you get to Amherst at EAS. Um, get bees while learning or learn as much as possible first. I like both of those, to be honest with you. I think both are fine. I kind of lean towards learn as much as you can at first because you'll be at a better chance of doing it right. But at the same time, you can learn and learn and learn. And then when you finally start, Sometimes you're like me, you can't remember what you learned or you see something you don't know what to do about. 
kind of maybe split the difference. Learn some very good fundamental things about bees, like take my online beekeeping class or something. Learn, learn the timing of bees. Learn, I think you should learn the biology of bees, the biology of the of the colony and the biology of the honeybee itself. Learn basic information, then start and keep learning. Now, how about that? I think that's a good answer. Hey, Michael, how are you doing? I get my nook early Saturday morning. When would you suggest I install the nook? Do you wait uh, next day, wait an hour, wait two hours? Yes, yes, and yes. Any other questions? <laughs> what I mean by that, it's not going to make any difference when it comes right down to it. Now, some people argue to the cows come home that you need to do it this way, need to do it that way. Doesn't really matter. You do it when you want to. If it was me, I'd go in and install them when I got home just because I want them to get work, get busy. But you can do any of those things. It'll work fine. Okay, Dark Party, $5. Appreciate that. You're getting your first bees next Wednesday. All you guys are getting your bees. Wow. I have one pack of Hive Alive fondant. Should I also have pollen patties? It's going to be around 65. You know, you need to do what you want. Uh, I really don't want to be the spokesperson of yes and no on any of those things. I've heard really good things about the Hive Alive fondant. I've met the uh, gentleman that uh, runs a company at Hive Life. I think it's a good product. The question of whether you need the pollen uh, pa patty also, not if they're bringing in pollen naturally. So if you've got dandelions blooming, if you got some stuff out there already, I wouldn't use pollen patties because they're going to not really want them as much as they want natural pollen. Thank you, David Kennedy, for the $10. David Kennedy, another great name. Everybody's named David tonight. We're going to have everybody named David leave a comment. That's great. Okay, I installed my nuke two weeks ago, and I already have a queen cell forming. Should I worry, and could I split this nuke? I would not suggest splitting a nucleus, because when you got it two weeks ago, it was probably five frames, I assume. No, do not split that. Don't split packages when you get them just to get more bees. Don't split nucleuses. Not a good idea. Got to build these hives up. Got to get them bigger. Um, this queen cell that's forming, um, it, you know, that's weird. Shouldn't happen, but it does. Bees never do what we want them to. I would say let them do that. Don't tear that supersede your cell down. Obviously, they don't like the first queen. Something's wrong, so they're raising a new one. Let that happen. And, and because if you try to buy a new one and tear that down, they might kill your new one and you'll be in this scenario where you can't get a queen going. So just let them work this out for sure. Hey, Randall, good to see you. I think Randall has already been here once, but put a new queen in one of my hives. How long before she starts laying? Thanks, David. If you put a new mated queen in there, obviously she's mated. Uh, her spermatheca is containing all the sperm she needs to immediately start fertilizing eggs. So that means as soon as they get her out of that cage, which is probably only going to take 24 hours, 48 if it's cold, you know, she's going to get out and kind of walk around the hive, get familiar, maybe a day or two. Who knows? But she's going to lay really fast. You should have a laying queen as soon as she's out within three days. Cassandra, good to see you. How long should a new hive be fed one to one? Thanks. I'm in Texas. If you're feeding one to one, we do it in the cases where they're still drawing out foundation. Foundation is that means that uh, the bees, you, you've got plastic foundation or wax foundation, a thin layer, and they haven't drawn out the comb yet. Feeding them helps because it takes 11, about 10 or 11 um, pounds of of nectar or honey or sugar water to turn into one pound of wax. So they need a lot of intake to make the foundation drawn out. So keep feeding them if they're drawing out. If there's stuff out there, there's nectar flows, flowers, and your combs are drawn out, stop feeding them. Matthew, how you doing? So glad I've taken the online courses. Thank you, Matthew. You guys really love these online courses that I've made several years ago. We made those before COVID. And, and so it really helped people out during COVID too. Watched a lot of content learning before getting my bees. And I'm glad I did. I feel a lot more confident about getting my bees on Saturday. Good for you. All right. Good. Yeah. Confidence. Being able to see and know and become familiar with uh, things is really important. Uh, knowing what the bees are going to be, how they're going to react, what what's going on with the bees, why you install them. So I totally am uh, glad that um, 
you, you did take my classes and you got a lot of stuff under your belt to get going. Good for you, Matthew. Appreciate it a lot. All right, Charlie. Having trouble getting my bees to move the stored honey into my double deeps up to my supers. Worried they may swarm because the queen doesn't have much room to lay. You could get um, honey bound in those deeps down there. Sometimes bees get excited about filling up every cell. They're coming in. They're bringing stuff. They don't take it up to the super. They don't draw the super out fast enough or something. It happens. What I would advise you to do if you want to, if it's capped over, you could take them out and spin them in your extractor and put them in jars and enjoy them. Spin out two or three or four in the center just to give the queen more room to lay. Maybe that would help. Maybe that's what you uh, might want to do. Um, otherwise, it is tough sometimes because they're, they've are they kind of got their brood nest built and they're they're constructing it and putting honey where they want it. Yeah, you, you might spin out some of the capped over honey frames and do, do something there. David Moore, $10. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you for uh, you and Sherry for all you do. Yeah, we don't want to skip Sherry because uh, she uh, it works so hard to keep things rolling and going and uh, handles more of the business side, the administration, the emails and all. So, um, boy, Sherry is uh, great to have as a wife. And a girlfriend, a lover, and a, uh, just a fellow business partner in, in the bee business here. So she keeps things going. So, yeah, I appreciate you guys. You even spelled her name correctly. Wow. Thanks, David. Another David. And you spelled Sherry's name correctly. <laughs> All right. That's great, isn't it? <laughs> awesome. Good deal. Oh. All right. Any more questions? Dan, thanks for the $20. Wow, I, I am so humbled by you guys donating tonight. It means so much to us, it really does. Uh, your deep diving video helps newbies like me remain calm. I will doing will be doing my first inspection after installing my nuke last weekend. Uh, wish me luck finding the queen. Yeah, that's so good. I understand that. Um, uh, Sherry, Sherry says, uh, apologize for me, David. I'm having technical difficulties. I've missed some of the donations. So some of you guys that have missed me recognizing your donations, we apologize. We've had a little glitch here uh, with the computer system downstairs that Sherry's on, and we've missed some of your donations. We're not trying to ignore you. Thank you. I'll try to see if I can go back and acknowledge you guys that we may have missed uh, on the next live stream or something, but we, we, we appreciate it nonetheless. Okay. Hello, David. I've had a new hive that I've had to put some frames together. Do I paint the frames? Uh, thank you. No, never paint any frames. Absolutely not. Don't ever paint any frames. Bees uh, don't need the paint on those wooden frames. I I'm glad you asked that. That's really good. Um, a lot of people think they need to paint the inside of the hive. They need to paint the frames. Uh, no, all only wood. They'll put propolis uh, in inside the hive on the walls, so don't paint that, and they'll take care of the frames too. Can bees get lazy when feeding sugar water? I think what you are asking is, well, I've heard this a lot, it's just uh, folklore that if you feed bees, what happens is they get lazy, they don't want to forage because the sugar water is right there in the hive. Most people also, though, they say, my bees aren't taking sugar water anymore, because they're going out and getting things like off of flowers. So no, I don't think you're going to make a hive lazy. Uh, but certainly if there's things to forage on, don't spend time feeding them. Let them go out and get it. ECPB's Coins Prospecting. Thank you for your $5 donation. I do remember talking to you at Hive Life. That was great. It was great seeing you too. Uh, yeah. Thank you that we're doing a live stream. I, I, I'm glad you appreciate that. Year four, raising my own queens this year. Hi, Sherry, spelt correctly. That's good because Sherry is kind of downstairs at our other location here trying to make all of this work, and she's having some glitches, so she's pulling her hair out down there. So she appreciates you acknowledging her efforts a lot. I know she does. Hang in there, Sherry. You're doing fine. It's okay. We all make mistakes. I can't have a perfect live stream it's not going to keep me from enjoying it and having a good time having a live stream with you guys. Just know we're not perfect. Art Monk, is mold in the hive a concern? No, not really. We all gonna, we're all going to see 
it's more of a mildew stain sometimes. Sometimes you can have the grayish white, greenish stuff on wet comb, wet frames that happen, you know, wet comb. Um, never seen it affect bees. I made a video of taking a frame out that was moldy and yucky and I put it in a, a strong colony. That colony cleaned it up in a matter of a week. It looked beautiful. It was gone. The bees flourished. Obviously, if the colony is really, really weak and it's all moldy and yucky in there and the pollen is all moldy and yucky, that's not a good thing. But I, I'm sure you're meeting like some, you know, mildew mold here and there. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Carol Livingston, good to see you. Uh, hello, David. Great chat tonight. My husband and I are one video away from finishing your Master Beekeeping course. Hmm, I don't have a Master Beekeeping course. You must mean the ultimate course. Uh, the classes are great, and we have so much confident, uh, confidence beekeeping. Well, good. That is so good to hear. I It's good to build up confidence. I, I think that's really good in beekeeping because we're all going to have a better time keeping our bees the more confident we feel about beekeeping and hey it all comes down to your years of experience the more you do it the more often you do it the longer you do it the more confidence you're going to have i have one nuke one package the nuke seems to use more one-to-one -one. also seems like they are drawing out less than the package thoughts on this yeah um the nuke is uh see the the uh see the nuke seems to be using more the nuke is using more because they already have brood established they're already got a laying queen in there they're already they're already the business is full steam ahead package starting up the business not going to need as much one-to-one -one probably is my guess and not drawing out as much let's see also seems like they're not drawing out as uh, drawing out less in the package package is kind of like a swarm they're wired to make their home flourish really quickly with drawn comb. So they're trying to build the comb out. Your nuke already had that comb. So there's a difference there for sure. Yeah, I see that. Christopher Moore, here's a question for you. If raising queens, how do we prevent them from killing each other? I've been a beekeeper about five years and I've never got into queen rearing. Yep, yep, that is a very good question, and I'm going to do this for Sherry. I want to thank Cottonland Apiary for your $10 donation. That means a lot to us. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. You must live in Cottonland. My mom and dad grew up uh, back in the 30s hand-picking cotton in fields in Arkansas. Maybe that's not what that means. <laughs> uh, yeah, how do you keep queens from killing each other is you never let them around each other. When you're raising queens, they're in their queen cells. When they get ready to emerge, three days before they emerge, you put them in a queenless colony or a nucleus or somewhere and let them emerge all by themselves. It's simple as that. Keep the queens from touching each other or getting around each other. That's what you do to uh, keep all these uh, queens uh, emerging by themselves in their own um, mating nuke. Hey, Robin, having problems with mold in my feeder. How do I, what do I use to clean it? Um, you know, yeah, again, it's going to get, I've got feeders out there that, that are moldy looking. It doesn't bother me. I'm not too worried about it. If you want to, if you can clean it with uh, away from the hive, if you can clean it, whatever kind of feeder you're talking about with a little bit of bleach and some water, that might knock that down. So that's important. You can learn more about queens also in Dr. John Zvishlak and my book that we wrote. It's a PDF file. We had to make some corrections to it yesterday, but um, it's available with the link there that Sherry popped up for us. For those of you that are asking queen rearing questions, this is a great book on queen rearing. Hey, I think I may have one. Yeah, here it is right here. Um, it's, it's similar to this. It's a PDF file when you get it online. But John and I spent a lot of time uh, putting this together to help you guys learn how to graft, learn how to raise queens, how to keep the uh, queens separated from killing each other. So thanks, Sherry, for reminding people. Just follow that link. Go to honeybeesonline.com is our website. Looks like we're nearing 8 o'clock, and you guys are just continuing to, to pour on to us tonight. Steve, thank you for your $20 donation. Uh, appreciate that so much. I really do. Uh, and also... Uh, Mr. Honeybee Scratcher, um, appreciate uh, your donation as well. So thank you, guys. Um, haven't touched my 12 hives yet. Had eight swarms that are doing well. Now I'm at 20 hives. I'm worried about my hives swarming as well. Uh, we've had so much cold, rainy weather. Now that it's gotten warmer and sunny, 
Uh, and I haven't had a chance to get caught up on all of my hives yet to do swarm prevention. I'm hoping they don't go off to the trees. Um, so anyway, yeah, I feel your pain. I really do. All right, guys, it's eight o'clock. So we're going to sign off. But let me first remind you guys to check out our website at honeybeesonline.com. Also, I want to thank you guys so much for what you're doing to my YouTube channel. You're watching it. You're subscribing to it. You're giving a thumbs up. You're leaving a lot of comments. Remember, I can't answer all your questions that you post as comments. I wish I could. My time is so uh, in the bee yards and such. But um, if you bring those questions here on Thursday night, I'll do my best to run through them and ask the questions so much. Thank you guys. So again, I, I love my YouTube channel so much. It, it brings a lot of joy to me to know that I'm helping you. That's why I love my channel because it's helping you. And I love making these videos for you. If nobody was watching, I wouldn't like making videos. So thank you. And also thank you for supporting my online courses. And if you want to know more about those, you go to honeybeesonline.com. My online courses, as many people mentioned tonight, is me teaching you. I really want to let you know, I appreciate you buying my online courses. They're, they're at your there, it's a convenient way for you to watch me just like right now for me to teach you through these online courses. You can keep them as long as you want. They're yours forever. You can watch them at comfort of your home. You can put pause and watch them later. They're always going to be there for you, uh, you know. And so it's really, it's not a Zoom meeting or anything like that. It's you personally watching me teach you. So thank you for uh, purchasing our online classes because I know you can go to a lot of places and get other classes. And when you support me, that allows me to do more of what I like to do is have money. I do this full time. I work full time for you guys making videos. So it's kind of scary, but I make my living off making videos to help you guys. So when you leave donations like you did tonight or you buy online courses for us, it helps us get our teeth filled and our flat tires fixed. <laughs> so thank you so much. All right, guys, I'm going to say good night to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you again in a future video, or we're going to see you again uh, next week as we jump into another live stream. So remember, every Thursday, be sure and check us out. See you later, guys. Thanks for joining us.